I'm very happy that we have Mark here again. I say again because he was last week with us in Frankfurt at our TBD retreat. And I will do a very short introduction for people who does not know Mark Blackster. He is leading the Tree of Life program at the Sanger Institute. And this program is generating and analyzing reference genome secrets from many thousands of species across the Tree of Life. But he's also, or he has also his own research group working on nematodes. So Mark, the stage is yours. Thank you all very much for inviting me here. I mean, yes, I was in, in Senckenberg the other day and that was a great to see people in three dimensions. Um, it's also great to see people even though I can't see you online. What I'm gonna try and do today is um, introduce you to the Tree of Life program at the Welcome Sanger Institute, explain what it is we do and give you some tiny, tiny uh, stories, little vignettes of the new biology we're able to do with these genomes. So I am not able to move on. Can Ellen or Lauren help me? Oh, ah, I see it now, it's at the top. Okay, thank you. So I call it new biology from new genomes. I really believe this. I believe we are going to change, we the people who are doing biodiversity genomics are gonna change the way we do biology forever. And um, the reason we're doing it is, is very varied um, across the people involved, whether it's conservation, whether it's an obsession with a particular species or whether it's interest in, in understanding something in the ecological evolutionary sphere. But what I think possibly motivates us all is this sort of feeling. And um, we are in the middle of the sixth great extinction. Biodiversity supports all life in Earth, on Earth, and we are, humans, are destroying biodiversity at an accelerating rate. And we want to be part, I think, all of us um, in ameliorating this change, but also providing the tools that allow us to do things like do biodiversity reconstruction, to um, understand how we rescue species, but also to build new economies and, and new ideas, new ways of working with nature rather than against it to maintain human society. So the project I'm part of I think is, if you like, the next step in the greatest um, bio project of all time, the greatest biology mega project of all time. Um, the Linnaean project, if you can call it that, is, a, is something that's run across uh, centuries now and has involved tens and tens of thousands of individuals. And what people have done is gone out and identified and named species. And this has given us a, a universal language to talk about species. Wherever you go, if you say Homo sapiens, people know what it is you're talking about. We can discuss the meaning of it. What, what is the species later? But basically we have a language to talk about everything. And I like to think about these names, these Linnaean names, as the, the titles of the books in the Library of Life. So we have a catalogue of not all, but many, many, about 1.8 million of the books in the Library of Eukaryotic Life. And we know approximately what's there. But those books are largely empty. We know something about the natural history. We know something about the occurrences. We know something about the morphology, but I would like to know their genomes. And people who are doing biology now would like to have the genomic data to try and go on and do something interesting beyond just natural history. So I've highlighted here the badger, the European badger, Meles Meles, very interesting carnivore, lives in social groups, um, also transmits bovine uh, tuberculosis. So rather than just having a record that there is a book or there should be a book called Meles Meles in the catalogue of the Library of the Tree of Life, we would like to actually make it possible to take that book out. Oops, the formatting gone a bit wrong here. Uh, we'd like to take that book out, allow you to take that book out of the library and see everything, see the entire genome of Meles Meles, free and open access. And so if you're interested in social behaviour, you're interested in carnivores, if you're interested in the immune system of the badgers, if you're interested in population genetics of badgers, that you can then just take that book out. So this idea of putting the text into the books in the Library of Life and making that an open lending library is a vision that um, was really started um, many, many years ago, but was given global form by the Earth Biogenome Project. So the Earth Biogenome Project is a network of networks, a network of groups who are trying to do biodiversity genomics, which has as its strap line sequencing life for the future of life. That's not just the future of this beautiful bee eater or the badger, but the future of human life on this planet. So 
I'm very proud to be here at the Sinai Institute doing the job I do, which is uh, leading the Tree of Life program. But the Earth Biogenome Project is a network of organizations around the planet um, who are trying to do very similar things. So here at the Sanger Institute, we're involved in a number of different projects. And I'll talk mostly about one of them today, which is the Darwin Tree of Life project. All these projects have as their goal, the sequencing to really high quality, the genomes of species across biodiversity. So whether this is from Britain and Ireland, these two little islands that we occupy, whether it's organisms involved in aquatic symbiosis, vertebrates are collaborating across Europe. We're all aiming for the same goal, which is sequencing genomes to help in conservation, help in understanding biology, and also helping uh, maintain human society and life on the planet. So I'm going to talk about um, the Darwin Tree of Life in the main. So the Darwin Tree of Life is a project to sequence all the eukaryotic species that we know live on these little islands, this archipelago, off the west coast of Europe. So Britain and Ireland aren't renowned for their biodiversity, um, but they are actually quite rich. And also what's very rich is our knowledge of the biodiversity. So we know all the species um, and we also know where they are found. And so we chose to focus our project on Britain and Ireland, mostly for this reason, actually, for this, this background knowledge, if you like, of what was here, but also because we feel that we can offer this as a gift to the world, if you like, so that if we sequence something in Britain and Ireland, for example, the European badger, that genome is then available for all who are interested in badgers, not just people who are interested in badgers in Britain, or even our badger came from Oxfordshire, even badgers that come from Oxfordshire. So um, our project um, has this idea of sequencing locally, but thinking globally, trying to think about how to build a project that will allow us to meet the goals of the Earth Biogenome Project, which is not to sequence 60 or 70,000 species, which is what's in Britain and Ireland, but 1.8 million species across the globe. Okay, we're a consortium, a partnership, and that partnership is between organizations such as the Sanger Institute, which are traditionally sequencing genomes, but also organizations that are more on the biodiversity side of things, who either manage biodiversity or have a core interest in counting and cataloging biodiversity. So managing biodiversity, things like Nature Scott and the Zoological Society of London, um, the, the managers, if you like, which are, are um, or the, the collectors, which are the Naturalist Museum and the Botanical Gardens at Kew and Edinburgh, but also the Marine Biological Association who monitor the seas. And then analytical organizations such as the Earth, such as the European uh, Bioinformatics Institute, um, and the EBI, and the University of Cambridge and the Ireland Institute, who are interested in analyzing the data, helping us analyze the data and provide computer backup. We're actually all involved in all sorts of things. Um, so, for example, the University of Oxford is analyzing data, but it also runs a field station, White and Woods. And many, many of the species we sequence are collected from this one field station, which is an ancient uh, woodland, ancient deciduous woodland. And this is now a genomic observatory, not just a, an ecological observatory, but a genomic one. And we're doing research to try and get uh, our protocols and procedures working better but mostly we're trying to produce genomes as high quality and as fast as we can. This is what we've built, we call it the genome engine, and it's a process that takes a specimen from the field, which is identified by a taxonomist, uh, turns it into DNA and RNA, sequences that DNA and RNA, assembles that DNA and RNA into a genome estimate, which is then curated and submitted to the public databases, it's then annotated to find the protein coding and RNA genes and the repeats. And then it's all made open. It's all made public. And finally, we publish something we call a genome note, which is a short announcement saying we have sequenced this genome. So we're working very hard to improve our extraction procedures. Um, I wish everything was easy to get DNA out of. It's not. Snails, for example, on this slide are not always easy. Um, we've been working very closely with the manufacturers of the long read platforms to try and optimize sequencing. And we mostly use Pacific Biosciences Hi-Fi on the SQL 2E in the past and now on the Revio. We also do Hi-C, chromatin confirmation capture sequencing to give us long range information. And we do RNA-seq to not to do differential expression, but to annotate the genome. Our assemblies um, are 
pretty much uh, automated these days. Still take a little bit of human in intervention, but we first of all make primary assemblies into contigs and then scaffold with high C. The curation step is really important. It's sorting out the local errors that scaffolding toolkits make and sorting out the complexities of centromeres and, and uh, telomeres to produce a genome which we believe is fully chromosomal, telomere to telomere, and then we submit it. The annotation is run by Ensemble, um, who have streamlined their annotation process such that they can now do annotation at some scale and very rapidly. And we put all our data out publicly, as I've said. So how are we doing? First of all, assembly at scale works. This is a lovely moth called Apira syringaria. And um, this is um, what you see is a high C plot there of the assembly that came out of the primary assembly. And um, it is remarkably complete. It's in its 31 chromosomes. There's only one gap in this assembly when you scaffold it. And so most species don't assemble quite as nicely as this. Lepidoptera assemble really beautifully, but many species do. And the ones that don't, we have skilled people in the assembly and, and curation team who can turn them into beautiful genomes. This genome isn't particularly big. Um, it's about half a gigabase. Most genomes on the planet are slightly bigger than that. The average is about one and a half gigabases, but most of those we can sequence with no trouble at all. We do hit problems. Some of the problems are in extraction, and, and I won't diminish those at all. It is still uh, an art getting DNA out of some species. But other problems come from the biology of the organisms themselves. So one of them is what happens when you get a big genome. So this is mistletoe, uh, Viscum album. Its genome size is somewhere around 90 to 95 gigabases. And um, that's a big genome, that's 30 times human. So um, to challenge ourselves, this was during lockdown, what can you do but challenge yourself? We decided to sequence this album. We sequenced more than 100 SQL 2E flow cells of HiFi data, and we also generated 50 fold coverage of high C data and assembled it. What's amazing is that it assembled. So this is a genome which is 30 times the size of the human genome. It's not polyploid, it's still standard diploid, it is just full of repeats. But the quality of the HiFi data means that we can walk through most repeats, and the high C data is, of, um, is unique enough to turn those uh, contigs from the HiFi data into chromosomes. So I'm going to show you another um, high C map. Colorways are different, but the story is the same. That along the diagonal, it's going from uh, top left to bottom right, is the dense signal, which shows you along the chromosomes. And um, you'll see there's a cross for each chromosome. That X is because the arms of the chromosomes interact with each other in the nucleoplasm, and so there's interactions observed between them. And also, all the telomeres of the chromosomes interact with each other, and so there's a lovely sort of crisscross tartan pattern across this uh, high C plot. So this high C plot is scaled to exactly the same size as the one I showed you for the moth, which was only half a gigabase. This is about 100 gigabases in span. And each one of those chromosomes, those crosses, is three whole human genomes in size. So the curated scaffold N50 is over nine gigabases. There are only 10 chromosomes. There's a slight curly cue of that. There's only 10 chromosomes. So we have assembled um, 100 gigabase, essentially 100 gigabase genome. Um, and that's with HiFi and HiC data. And um, we're now struck with a problem. The, the assembly is beautiful. We start with a problem. We can't actually submit this to the public databases at the moment because the public databases don't accept sequences longer than just over two gigabases. So we're having to cut the genome up to fit it in. One of the things I'd just like to say about this genome is, um, fine, it's got 10 chromosomes. The um, Viscom album has five autosomes and five sex chromosomes, five X chromosomes. The, the one we sequenced was a female, so it has five Xs. So fully half this genome, fully half this genome is sex chromosome DNA. So that's, I, you can think about that either as there are 15 human genomes worth of sex chromosome in this organism, or that the sex chromosomes in this organism have about 300 times the span of our own sex chromosome, our own X chromosome. The other thing we found in this, in this genome was a small chromosome, an independent uh, linkage group, linkage element, which looks odd. Um, it has a lot to repeat. And it's possibly a B chromosome. We're going back to the individual that we sequenced to check whether this was true. So we can assemble really big, really complicated genomes. 
And here's the other problem, or one of the other problems we've met. Some things are very small. This is a view down a microscope of um, minor fauna from a marine sediment. So how do we sequence these things? Not only are they small, sometimes they have very big genomes. The small size is a real problem because it means they haven't got very much DNA in terms of absolute mass in them. So we've been developing methods to allow us to sequence single specimens of things like nematodes and flatworms and tardigrades. This is just an illustration of that. This is um, Adonkalimus thalassophagus, which is a, an inoculid nematode. Um, it was sequenced using a protocol called PIMS, which is uh, developed by Chris Lawmer, which involves um, a very careful amplification of long fragments. Um, it assembled really quite nicely. The genome isn't that large. It's 147 megabases. What's exciting about this is uh, Erna King, who did this work, took 22 individuals of the same species, she hoped, put them in a tube and had high C generated from those. And that was enough to assemble this into 14 chromosomes. So this is the first chromosomal assembly from the Anoplida, which is uh, one of the great divisions of Nematoda. So there's um, three classes. This is one of the classes. This is the first Anoplid genome ever generated. And it's, it's um, amazingly good. The other thing we notice when we sequence these things, we're taking them from the wild. And so we get their microbiome as well. We call it cobiome because we don't know whether it's from the gut or whether it's on the surface or whether it's a parasite or a pathogen. And so, for example, this moth um, came along with a lovely 31 nuclear chromosomes, but also a mitochondrion, which we expected, and then three different Wolbachia. So Wolbachia is an alpha proteobacterium, um, which does re reproductive manipulation. And this individual moth had three different Wolbachia strains in it. Um, and Emily Vancaster has gone on to analyze the Wolbachia we get from all of our <laughs> genomes. And so we have 110 new Wolbachia genomes that she published in this paper. And we can now analyze the um, association of Wolbachia with hosts. She can also analyze the association of Wolbachia in space. So many of the insects came from White and Woods, this genomic observatory. She can look, she's looked at whether or not the Wolbachia that are circulating in White and Woods are more related to each other than they are to others. So in fact, they're not, which is very interesting. But what is interesting is, for example, the Lepidoptera here are more likely to be infected with supergroup B or back here than they are with supergroup A. And we can say that with some uh, surety now. So we're looking at all sorts of cobions in our genomes and symbionts and parasites. All our data are open and public. So this is really important to us that our data are out there for people to use. They're not under embargo. When we make them public, they are public for you to use. And we have a, an overall portal for the Darwin Tree of Life called portal.darwintreeoflife.org. But importantly, all our raw data goes live the minute it is generated. So um, I haven't had time today to look at our Tall QC portal. So if you go on that Tall QC portal, you will find new data, which nobody at the Sanger Institute, nobody in the Darwin Tree of Life project has yet looked at. And you'll be able to see where we're, how we're progressing with the project. Um, the ensemble annotation is public. We have interactive genome viewers, Blob Toolkit, for example. We publish everything as a genome note, which are short, definitive statements. This is the genome we sequence. Please use it. Those are all open access, welcome open research. We have a global coordination portal called Genomes on a Tree, which, where we post everything we're doing. And even this slide deck is open. So if you go to toll pacbio 2023 you can get access to this slide deck. And please use the slides and promote our project um, give us credit for, for what we've done, but promote slides, promote the project through our use of our slides. So I'm just going to give you a quick hint about where we're going. We're aiming to get to about 4,000 species in our first phase for DTOL. That's going to be one per family. That's about 40% of all the families on the planet. And we're doing reasonably well. So we've actually got into the Institute at Sanger just over 5,000 species. Um, and this corresponds not to 4,000 families, it actually corresponds to about 2,000 families, but we are continuing to collect and it's summer, so we're collecting really fast. And our next goal is, uh, and this is the statement of progress to date, so this is what we've got running, if you like. We've got just under 1,000 species completely submitted, and those come from 309 different families. And we're actively working on an additional 2,600 species from another 900 families. The tree is, is a taxonomic tree um, and it shows you where we sequence. Blue is where it's in progress. Red is where it's complete. 
And I hope you can see that we're sequencing across life from protists, across the diversity of protists, all the diversity of, of viridae planti and fungi, and then also through the diversity of animals. Our next step, our next phase, will be to sequence about 20,000 species. That's approximately one for every genus, um, but that's our, our next goal after we complete phase one. So what are we doing with these genomes? Well, I'm just going to give you two very quick pictures of things we've discovered by doing whole genomes, complete reference genomes, which we couldn't have done without them. First one is nematodes. It's as mentioned, I work on nematodes. This is my favorite genome. It's from Cenorhabditis elegans. It was the first animal genome ever sequenced. It's about 100 million bases long. It comes in six chromosomes, and those chromosomes are wonderfully patterned by evolution to partition different genomic features onto different components of the chromosomes. So it's absolutely standard genome, telomere to telomere, wonderful stuff done 25 years ago. So we've been sequencing other, many other nematodes, many other nematodes. I've also met other members of the genus Cenorhabditis. And what we're doing is we're trying to look at genome evolution through Cenorhabditis. And one thing we discovered, and we were kind of primed to discover it because we'd seen it in other nematodes, in some nematodes which arise basally in the genus, is this strange pattern of IC here. So in the previous IC plots, the signal on the diagonal shows you where the chromosomes are. And in this high C plot, it really looks like there are multiple chromosomes, many more than six. So there are multiple squares of, of interaction. Um, so in fact, there are six, uh, 15 different squares of interaction. But if we look at in between these squares of interaction, there are actually links between these at much lower level. What is this is called program DNA elimination. The germline has a complete copy of the genome, but the soma has a fragmented genome. So some pieces of the genome are actively excised, chopped out specifically, precisely at particular sites. And then new telomeres are added to the broken chromosomes. And so the soma has a different genome composition from the germline. Exactly why is a long discussion. But what this means is that we've actually found it in several species at the base of Cenorhabditis. This is actually a quite common thing in nematodes to find programmed DNA elimination. It's also found in other species across life. And this is just a, a vignette of what gets pulled out. So in this particular region, which cuts in the middle of the, is a cut in the middle of chromosome two of Cenorhabditis monodelphis, it's just ordinary DNA. There is a, a, a repeat there, but the rest of it is ordinary DNA. There are genes in there. And um, the genes may have roles in embryogenesis, which are disposable in the soma, but this is a way of, of genomic regulation that we didn't expect previously. And in fact, we found it in several places across nematodes. So the big green stars here are the three major groups where we know it happens, the ascarids, the panagrams, and the rhabditids. And inside the rhabditids, we have it happening in multiple different genera, including now Cenorhabditis. Some Cenorhabditis don't do it. C. elegans doesn't do it, but other Cenorhabditis do. That's one story. Here's another story. <laughs> Sorry, running a bit because I'm over time, according to the, the clock, um, is in Lepidoptera. So we sequence a lot of butterflies and moths because they sequence really beautifully. And we end up with chromosomal assemblies. And we can start asking about how have chromosomes evolved in these species. And so most, most of the Lepidoptera have 31 chromosomes. This is actually the result of an ancestral fusion deep, deep in Lepidoptera between a really basal 32 chromosome unit. But most species have 31 chromosomes. And we can spot that some groups of species have had additional rearrangements. But that means that these chromosomes in general have been traveling as independent units for many, many million of years of time. And so we can start looking at the chromosome biology, the, the long-term phylogenetics of chromosome biology in this species. So we can define ancestral linkage groups, and we can ask what's the pattern of the evolution of those linkage groups through time. I said most of them are conserved. There are some species which have gone crazy. This is a group of uh, two groups of, of butterflies, the blues, the lysenids, and pierids, the, the cabbage white and friends, where very strange things have happened compared to other lepidoptera. And the pierids, which are on the right-hand side, the chromosomes have been chopped up and then glued back together again. So they have a low number of chromosomes, but the chromosomes are completely jumbled compared to the ancestor. Whereas in lysenids, the chromosomes have just been chopped up. 
And so what we have here is, is two different patterns of evolution and allows us to dissect the two different processes that are going on, scission and fusion, in the evolution of lepidopteran chromosomes. And because we, there, here's an example of, of this um, cut and paste version of uh, the, the cabbage white, where the Marian elements, the ancestral linkage groups are basically striped across all the different chromosomes. And this allows us, this analysis of ancestral linkage groups allows us to look across um, Lepidoptera at orthologous chromosomes. So I'm always excited by saying that this graph here with the dots and the lines actually has 3000 chromosomes on it. So each dot is the biology of a chromosome. And we can say in this case, the repeat density of chromosomes is strongly correlated with its length in every single species. And this is probably something to do with recombination because small chromosomes have a higher recombination uh, per megabase than do long ones. But there's all sorts of interesting stories in here which um, these chromosomal assemblies are beginning to bring out. So this is what we've done so far. I've shown you a vignette of some 200 Lepidoptera and one nematode. And um, there's another um, 700 species on this graph, on this tree, which are open to you to use. You can also use the butterflies and, and nematodes. But all these data are there for you to use and you to build your genomes and your biology and your research programs on. And I hope that all of you who are younger scientists who are watching this realize that you're about, you're at the start of the real genome era, that biology over the next hundred years is actually going to be based on reference genomes like this. Okay, so I get to talk to you from my office. Um, but this work is actually done by other people. So our collaborators in the Darwin Tree of Life, these are the people who collect the samples, identify them, ship them to us, people who do um, some of the analysis. And especially shout out to the engaged naturalists, the people who um, go out into the field and know where to find that moth or that plant. Um, the people inside the Tree of Life who have built this genome engine and run this genome engine to turn every sample into a genome and especially our colleagues in the scientific operations who run the sequencing instrumentation. The nematode and butterfly work in, was done in my lab by Pablo, Luis, Manuela, Erna, Martha, and Charlotte, who I forgot to put on this list. And for the nematode work, we also collaborate uh, quite widely with others who are interested in small wiggly things that live in the soil. And I'll leave you again with the picture that we started off with which is the t-shirt we made for when we got to 500 genomes, which was only in November this year. And very soon we'll be at a thousand genomes and we have to design a new t-shirt, a new picture. But just to gaze at this and to think that only three years ago, um, none of the genomes that are on this picture had been sequenced and now they have and now they're available for you to use. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, very much for this great talk. So um, there's one question in the chat. And um, Michael, he says, great talk, Mark. And what is the purpose or evolutionary advantage of somatic DNA elimination? Oh, that's almost as long a question as what is a species, Michael. Thank you for that. Um, so there are lots of thoughts about this. And I think with the nematode work we're doing, we're starting to hone in on some of the reasons. So one idea is that it is to control differential expression of genes between the soma and the germline. There can be conflict between soma and germline in what a gene should do. And one way of avoiding that is to make sure that the gene cannot be expressed in the soma. So and a way to do that is to eliminate it entirely. So we, we, that's, a, that's a reasonable argument. It sounds quite logical. To me, that would predict that the same genes were present in the eliminated DNA in all the species, and they're not. So there, there are no really um, conserved genes in all the eliminated DNA. Another one might be that you can control gene expression in some way. When you break a chromosome up, you maybe change the, the, the topologically associated domains. And that could be true. We haven't really got a good assay for that. But at a gross level, we don't see any huge change in the um, in the chromatin conformation uh, patterns for the broken versus the complete chromosomes when, we, when we've got an example of that. Um, another one is to get rid of repeats. Um, so some people suggest that very frequently repeats are eliminated. Um, 
that's fine. And in some pieces, places you do see repeats eliminated, in others you don't. And so in some species, it's not for elimination repeats. And actually, it's the wrong way around because you want to eliminate repeats from the germline, not the soma. So why invent a whole mechanism to eliminate them from the germline when it's actually from the soma, when it's actually the germline you want to clean up? So to me, that argument is the wrong way around. And we can just describe a phenomenon, but I don't think it describes the mechanism. To me, it is just a way of defining the difference between soma and germline and it ensures that the germline is in control. The soma, I presume, is incompetent in making a new organism. And so maybe it's, a, it's an echo of an ancient Weissmann uh, division between germ and soma line, germ line and soma, and this is the germline exerting control. It, we'll find out, we don't know yet. Okay. So I, I have also a question regarding this issue because we heard today about the songbirds because they also, they also had this program DNA elimination. So, but it's not in, it's related or it's something different from which, what you do observe in nematodes, correct? Correct. So there, there appear to be two different kinds of uh, uh, program DNA elimination. They can be found in the same species, but they're actually quite distinct. So one is uh, elimination that only happens in the germline, okay? And that is to do with um, um, manipulating what gets transmitted to the next generation. And there's elimination which only happens in the soma, and that's to do with presumably either eliminating gene expression from the soma or blessing the germline in some way. So the, the um, germline restricted chromosome in songbirds is very similar to the elimination we see here, except in that case it's of whole chromosomes rather than parts of chromosomes. So yeah, every songbird, hagfish, lampreys, several mammals, uh, several marsupials, crustaceans, um, uh, several nematodes as I've told you about, um, ciliates do this to make the, the macronucleus from the micronucleus. So it's a very common process in mm -hmm. biology, in life. Um, and we're only just getting the genomic tools to be able to analyze it. Okay, thank you. So there's another question coming from Alexander. He asks, vast descriptive knowledge of genomes tempting intervention in natural processes. Do you have vision fears of that? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Me maybe, maybe. Um, am, am, I, am I concerned that... Um, the oh, data yes. in will be used for, for ill, for evil. I will add him. Maybe he's now coming in. It's okay. Read the question out again and I'll have another go. Vast descriptive knowledge of genomes tempting intervention in natural processes. Do you have vision fears of that? Alexander. I, here he is. You are I'm muted. Not. Can you unmute and repeat the question? No, I can't I, I, hear it. So maybe the question is about um, how should we use these data? Um, and obviously, um, all scientific data, there are uh, very clever ways to use it. Um, so if we sequence a fungus, maybe there's an antibiotic um, synthesis cluster, biosynthesis cluster in that, and it's possible to to clone that back into a bacterium or into, a, into an industrial yeast and make gram or kilogram quantities of a new antibiotic. Um, so that to me seems like a, a, a good for humanity, but maybe if that antibiotic is badly used, it's a, it's a bad thing for the environment. So I think uh, all data has a possibility of, of good use and poor use. Um, I think on balance, there is no doubt that sequencing genomes is a, a thing for good because, especially if we do it openly, because it allows everyone to see what is around them, whether it's using eDNA, whether it's using um, analysis to, to dive into the genomes and ask what's possible. Um, I guess the, the question is, is some way about are human beings good or evil? Um, I think I have to believe that most human beings are good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then there's another question from Anna Hunsdorfer. She wants to order a t-shirt and wants to know where. <laughs> yeah, we get lots of questions about this T-shirt. I'm going to have to put it on. Um, yes, I, I don't think it's ethical for me to give you a link to an online shop. That, uh, but uh, let's think. 
I could. I could give you a link to an online shop and you can you can read. And um, why don't I say that I will give Pack Bio um, a link to the online shop and you can choose to distribute it round the participants if you would like to. Um, it is available on an online t-shirt shop, so you can order your own one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, that's sell them and ask, I'll put a little premium on each one and uh, when we sold a thousand, we can do another genome. Okay. <laughs> one question from Ralf Vogelsang. Are you collecting all the kinetic sequencing information to look at the epigenomes? So we are. So that, that comes with a standard with, with SQL2E um, and the Revio instruments. And we're, we're not using it in any um, detail. Um, we found that the methylation calls, the fifth base calls, if you like, from the, the uh, back bio data are really good for mammals, but they don't always work for other taxa. We're not quite sure why this is. Maybe the sequence context of the methylation is, is, uh, is different in these other species and it just needs better training. I presume, one presumes that the model is trained essentially on human. So um, those data are available. We don't tend to submit that data. Um, I guess we could move on to do that. Um, one test we did was that there's a, a species we know has lost all methylation. I, no, there are no methylation genes in its genome. And yet the, the methylation caller was quite confident in calling 10 or 15% of CP, CPGs as methylated. So it's probable that there's some uh, tuning of those algorithms needed. So at the moment we're not using it, um, but those data are available. Okay. So I think I, I have one last question. I think, we, I think we have to close the session because we're already over time. But so we all observe that there are some species which are really hard to sequence. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there is something that PacBio can do to support or help us to improve sequencing difficult to sequence species? Wow. I'm sure there are. <laughs> it's cheaper so we can do more experiments. I mean, that's, that's, a, great, that's a great way to help this. Um, I think um, it's hard to, it, most of the issues we have, I think are probably to do with DNA damage during extraction, mm -hmm. um, where we think we've made some lovely DNA, but in fact, when you melt it to make it single-stranded, um, it falls apart. So I think that's a major issue. So maybe better DNA repair um, protocols. Mm -hmm. um, what else? We, we see quite, a, I mean, different species, but especially in, in fish, for example, teleos fish, we see a lot of GA repeat dropouts. Mm -hmm. It'd be really nice if that could be improved because it makes those assemblies look really bad, even though it's the best we can do. Um, what else? Lowering the sample input requirements. So we don't have to use, we don't have to get so much DNA. The more we can get DNA enough to sequence after an organism with a thousand cells um, using our PCR method, um, it'd be really nice if without PCR, we could do sequencing, for example, um, from only a nanogram or two, or, or two of DNA rather than having to have half a microgram. So yeah. I think making, making all the library production procedures much more efficient. Okay. And, um, I totally support it. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so um, I think we come to an end. Thank you very much for this really exciting, interesting talk and also to the audience for the questions. And I hope we see us next year again at the next yeah. Senckenberg Biodiversity Symposium. Okay. Indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>